Good morning, everyone. Do we have uh, Conway also? People at Conway? Or? I think they, they should be there, but okay. there's no problem. Conway. <laughs> So the topic today is arterial occlusive disease. It's, it's a very broad topic. Uh, we're going to touch base uh, regarding the symptoms of the patients, the diagnostic workup, and management. And then we'll go over a few of the questions uh, from the SCORE curriculum, uh, how to address these problems. So um, the topic for today will be iliac occlusive disease, peripherals, FEMPOPs, uh, these are core for like uh, like basic everyone should know this. Advanced comes to like fourth or fifth level resident and uh, especially important for like oral board exams. So PAD peripheral arterial occlusive disease uh, uh, manifests as chronic PAD or acute limb ischemia. So differentiation is extremely important because your management is going to depend upon whether this is chronic or acute, how fast you have to intervene on these patients. So chronic PAD, sometimes it's asymptomatic. Uh, most of the time, it's intermittent claudication. Um, other time, it presents with critical limb ischemia. Critical limb ischemia constitutes two things. It's very important. Please understand two things, rest pain and tissue loss. That constitutes critical limb ischemia. And the next part is acute limb ischemia. Sometimes the dog diagnosis is obvious, like this patient has a gangrene of the toes, so um, which category does this patient comes into? So this is critical limb ischemia. So claudication uh, is exertional, rest pa exertional pain. Um, patient walks. When he rests, the pain is relieved. It can happen uh, in the thighs or it, in the calves. If it's in the calf, then um, the clue is that the arterial disease is most probably in the SFA. If it happens in the thigh and the buttocks, that means the disease is higher up in the aortoiliac segment. So typically occurs at the same distance. After resting, the patient can resume walking and the pain recurs at the same distance every time. And typically, it does not progress to amputation. We'll go over the natural history of claudication, rest pain, and critical limb ischemia that how, why we intervene on these patients, what will happen if we do not intervene in these patients. So rest pain, um, it's typically uh, sometimes you walk in um, and the patient is in the, lying in the bed, but the leg is hanging on the bedside. So that's a typical presentation for rest pain. Usually it's a four foot pain in the dorsum of the foot Typically worse at night, uh, gravitation forces tends to bring the blood flow more to the foot. That's why they keep dangling the foot, and that's how they get edema of the leg, dependent rhubarb, uh, while dangling the, uh, the feet uh, over the bedside. So this is tissue loss. Um, can present with a ulceration, superficial ulceration, versus uh, extensive gangrene. So, um, can someone tell me what is Lurid syndrome? Let's start with Nick. Uh -huh. Okay. So, three things in this syndrome. Katrina? What are the three things in this syndrome? Claudication, impotency, and absent femoral pulses. Three things. So basically, this uh, syndrome, or initially in 1914, uh, Graham, uh, Dr. Graham, he, he was a surgeon, 
uh, he described this, but uh, but he did not describe the triad, like three things. This was described by a French surgeon, Le Rich, blutocortication, impotency, and absent femoral pulses. So when, when you see these kind of patients with absent femoral pulses, what do you think, how should we proceed with the, what should be the diagnostic modality of these patients? How about an angiogram? Right, so if you don't feel the pulse, you won't. So basically to study the aortoiliac segment, CTA or MRA, depending upon the patient's renal function, uh, not the angiogram is not the answer on the test. So coming to the Rutherford's uh, classification, this is for chronic limb ischemia. Uh, so category zero is asymptomatic, one is mild intermittent claudication, two is moderate, three is severe, four is rest pain, five is minor tissue loss, and six is major tissue loss. Again, very important, this is for chronic limb ischemia, this is not for acute limb ischemia. So whenever you see these uh, patients, the first thing you uh, um, order in the clinic or in the hospital is if it's chronic, so you have to determine whether, whether it's chronic or acute. Uh, so for chronic PAD patients, the first thing you order is non-invasive vascular studies. You don't want to start with the angiogram. That's very invasive. So you start with non-invasive vascular study. You can order an ultrasound duplex. You can order segmental waveforms, which they do not do in this hospital, but uh, it's, it's quite common if you have a vascular lab, they usually do it. So arterial duplex will tell you the anatomy of the arterial tree, common femoral, SFA, and distal as well. Uh, it's very operator dependent, not very reliable. Patients who are diabetic, they have heavily calcified vessels, uh, so the ABI is falsely elevated in those patients. For example, a diabetic patient comes with an ABI of 1 and he's complaining of a lot of pain. We usually don't, oh, ABI is 1, you're good. No. So usually it's falsely elevated. Usually they are higher than 1 ABI. So you have to feel for the pulses. You have to determine that the patient needs a CTA or an angiogram in those cases. Um, the next uh, modality is CTA versus MRA. Um, again, uh, depending upon the renal function of the patient, um, gadolinium uh, is, is used in MRAs also. Um, so patient who have chronic renal insufficiency, gadolinium is contraindicated because it causes nephrogenic uh, systemic fibrosis, um, but they have a means to do it without contrast these days too. But Vic, uh, I think just want to add this, gadolinium is another drug which can be on your written exam as a side effect. It will surprise you that why are they asking a surgeon, but I think this could be the relevance. It will be on your written exam. Right. Um, so we always tend to say, oh, the patient has renal dysfunction. Let's avoid the CT. Let's get MR. But it's very important to look at the creatinine clearance, look at the GFR when you order MR also to prevent the nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. So the next modality is angiography. So the benefit of angiography is obviously it's diagnostic. You can determine like where the lesion is, where the stenosis is, and you can treat at the same time depending upon uh, how complex the lesion is. So this is extremely important slide for uh, written exams as well as oral exam. So this was my uh, scenario in oral exam in general surgery board. So what's the treatment for claudication? The first thing is, uh, so everything is risk factor modification, medical management. First treatment is medical, second is medical, third is medical. No surgical intervention for claudication. <laughs> uh, especially for general surgery boards. So always, they'll tend you to operate on the patient, but do not operate on the patient. Treat them medically as much as you can. So smoking cessation, lifestyle modification, control of blood pressure, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, make sure their hemoglobin A1C is okay, their blood sugars is okay. Um, this word is extremely important, supervised 
So voice walking program. This is the word they want to hear. Like the candidate is saying this word or not. So basically what exactly this is, is 30 minutes walking three times a week. And it happens in like uh, where they can document like when the patient came and he did exercise for 30 minutes and he's doing three times a week. So you walk to the point, you rest, you walk to the point. That means you increase your claudication distance every time. And um, what it does is, is it increases the collateral circulation to the feet so that you increase the walking distance every time you walk. The other drug uh, which we use for claudication is uh, Celestazole, uh, Plato. This is also on the exam sometimes. It's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Um, it reduces platelet aggregation and vasodilation. So it, this is extremely important again, claudication, lifestyle modification, smoking cessation, control of hypertension, risk factor modification, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, make sure they're on statin. And important word is supervised walking program. Uh -huh. boards, if they tell you that okay, the patient did this for six months, follow all these things. We'll go over that, Sally, I'm going Very important question, but we'll go over that. So, um, so we discussed about claudication, we discussed about rest brain, critical limb ischemia. So why we operate on these patients? What happens if we don't operate on these patients? So this is a natural history of uh, lower extremity uh, peripheral artery disease patient. If it's a critical limb ischemia patient, one year outcome, look at the amputation rate, 30%. If you do not revascularize these patients, mortality is 25%. And if you leave, if there is only claudication, five year outcome in the limb, they, five to 10% of these people are going to, in five years, going to get into the, this bracket, critical limb ischemia, and then go ahead for amputation. And the risk, the other issue is if you, so peripheral vascular disease is a marker of coronary artery disease as well. So that's why when you, when you see the patient in the clinic or in the hospital, we always recommend get an echo, get a stress test, get cardiology to see the patient. Make sure there's no coronary artery disease because you don't want to put the patient to sleep and uh, MI on the table. So it's like life over limb or limb over life. So it's very important to look at the cardiovascular risk uh, modification as well um, because the mortality is extremely high uh, from the cardiovascular standpoint as well. So um, basically, uh, this was in a little bit of uh, nutshell definitions, symptoms, non-invasive tests, CT, MR, then invasive angiography, then uh, we went for the, like what's the natural history, why we operate on these patients. We're gonna go over a few of the questions and uh, we'll address like more of the issues on those questions. So there's a 45 year old uh, woman who is referred with complaints of right thigh and calf claudication occurring at 100 yards that began six months ago after hospitalization for cardiac cath. Assuming that she has no longer any cardiac symptoms, what diagnostic tests would you obtain before any planned intervention? So non-invasive testing is very important. So what do you think is happening with this patient? So, so the patient has right thigh and calf claudication. So where exactly in the arterial tree the disease is? So thigh could be higher up, it could be iliac disease also, um, but uh, ephemeral SFA disease is very, uh, because calf claudication will give you SFA, SFA uh, stenosis will give you calf claudication, and femoral or iliac will give you thigh claudication. What if the problem was in buttock? What she had in buttock claudication. So where was the where will be the disease? Aortoiliac disease. So the first thing you order is a non-invasive test, ultrasound ABIs. All right. Let's assume this her ABI is uh, 0.6 on the right and uh, 0.8 on the left. She's sitting in the clinic. She's waiting for your answer. What are, what are you going to do next? 
cessation. Exactly. Like claudication, you have claudication, no, no, just keep going with uh, risk factor modification. There's no need for any intervention at this time. Would you get ultrasound to provide arterial ultrasound? That's why we got the ABI, the duplex ABI. Sometimes when you order just the ABI, or you order the ultrasound of the leg with the ABI. Usually they do the both things. The duplex, look at the arterial tree also, and ABI. Um, the one thing that's not available in this hospital is segmental pressures and waveforms. Then you can like demarcate where exactly the, the disease is. So they are very helpful. Toe pressures, they don't do here. That's very helpful too. Uh, so obviously physical examination is extremely important, palpating the femoral pulses, palpating the distal pulses, then going for non-invasive testing, and then going for the treatment for claudication, that's a uh, risk factor modification. So next patient is a 58-year-old, uh, non-smoking, six-month history of bilateral buttock claudication at 50 feet, gluteal wasting. So from history, you know where, where exactly the problem is going to be. Lower extremity pallor, absent femoral pulses, and impotency. With non-invasive studies revealing the ABI 0.35. So how are you going to evaluate this patient? What test are you going to order on this patient? So again, this is a non-invasive test, but still, like we already have the ABI 0.35. So CT is the... CTA versus MRA, depending upon the renal function, is the diagnostic uh, modality in this patient. Why not angiogram? Nick? Yeah, you're not able to feel the pulse. That's why it's very important when we bring the patient to the, like in the pre-op area when we examine the patient, it's always important to feel the femoral pulse and plan accordingly, like how you're going to plan the angiogram. For example, the patient is too large to fit in the CT scanner. Awe, what do you think uh, we should do now? It's too large to fit in the CT scanner with this case, right? Yep. We can try open air CT scanner, that's available. Mm -hmm. um, can we refer the patient to Mayo Clinic? Mm -hmm. Refer the patient to Mayo? You can do an angiogram for brachial axis. Yes, exactly. So which brachial axis would you use for the angiogram? Left or right? Raise your hands if you say left. How many for right? So Derek, why right? Uh, I can't remember why. It's the favorite side. I think, you know, it's probably the quickest, easiest way to get in the arch. Uh, uh, I, I really don't remember. Why? All right, Rachel, you said left? Who said left? One second. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Why left? Yeah, I feel like the right, you can go across the arch. The right, you have to go across the anonymous. Sorry. 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 Right, 
left brachial you would only help like the left vertebral wire. So catheter manipulation because these patients who have peripheral arterial disease, they have arch disease, they have ar ar like calcified arch. That's why sometimes we are extremely careful about manipulating the catheter in the heavily calcified uh, aorta. So, so left brachial is, is better approach than the right brachial because the risk of stroke is high. But any time you do a just a like cerebral vasculature, like extracranial carotid or intracranial carotid diagnostic angiogram, it carries a one percent risk of stroke, even with just diagnostic angiogram. The so catheter manipulation is extremely important in the art or wherever you're manipulating the catheter. <coughs> so for this patient. CT or MRA rather than invasive uh, angiography. But if the CT MRA is not possible, then you do a diagnostic angiogram through the left brachial artery route. So if you're planning to do, so for example, obviously patient has severe aortoiliac occlusive disease, you're planning to do a aortobifemoral bypass on this patient. What other vessels are you you will closely look on CT or your diagnostic angiogram when you plan the aortic procedure. Renals. Renals. Good. So always, whenever you plan for, to do a aorta, always look at the renals and the paravisceral segment of the visceral vasculature. Always, because most of the times they have stenosis in the renal. You can address right there when you are, or if they have celiac SMA problem, then you can address the same like when you do the open operation. You don't want to do the infrarenal repair and then like a month later you're looking at the CAT scan or oh, the SMA, severe disease, the patient was symptomatic. So ask the symptoms also for the visceral uh, or mesenteric ischemia, chronic mesenteric ischemia. Uh, look at the renals and the paravisceral side. All right, next question. 75 year old with history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, uh, has noted gradual onset of calf, thigh, and buttock claudication over two years. Now occurring at three blocks, he denies any resting ischemia pain or non-healing ulcers. Uh, what are your initial recommendations for this patient? So the most important uh, clue is he denies any resting ischemia pain or non-healing ulcers. So the intervention is for three things. Lifestyle limiting claudication. Second is rest pain. Third is any ulcers or gangrene. So three things you intervene, especially like for aorta, aortic uh, interventions. Um, rest pain and tissue loss are the most more important things. Depending upon what other comorbidities the patient has, then you can intervene on lifestyle modification, lifestyle limiting claudication also. So initial recommendations for this patient will be. Again, smoking cessation, risk factor modification, supervised exercise program. Okay. 64 year old with ischemic rest pain of the left foot. So now she has ischemic rest pain, ulcer on the tip of the first toe. She has a four centimeter occlusion of the left common and one centimeter of the right common area. She's increased operative risk because of COPD. She's on five liters of home oxygen. How, how are we gonna approach this patient? So left common is occluded. Right has 50% uh, stenosis. So severe COPD, MI three months ago, stroke a month ago, but then walking. So always make sure like the patients are ambulatory when you start intervening. If the patient is non-ambulatory, but there is no point doing a big surgery. All right, so how, how are you going to approach this patient? Jim? Some sort of address 
Side, I would go endovascular. I was asked, Do I do endovascular? I said, I don't, but I refer it to my colleague. And they were happy with it and they moved to the next, to how to deal with the left. So it's kind of how the exchange goes. And one of my friends, he got the same scenario on him when he got a complication of ethroembolism after the CTA. So there are many stems which can originate from this, and you see this in your real life as well. It's okay to say endovascular, I don't do it, but this is the best for the patient. In this scenario, it's the classic book uh, scenario for the boards as well. All right, next question. 75-year-old uh, former smoker, hypertension, CHF, three months of bilateral rest pain, and both externally legs are out. So how would you approach this patient? Obviously, is a significant perioperative risk of morbidity and mortality for open aortic procedure. Yoko. So, uh, I'd make sure that he was medically optimized. Mm -hmm. So make sure that they see the cardiologist and do the work of that. I would make sure. 
I would make sure that helps. Um, and then I would do, I guess, extra anatomical intervention. So an X-ray, five level would be the same as thing for a patient with CHF. And okay. All right. Um, so the answer to this question is extra anatomic bypass. So how do you uh, assess the patient? How do you prepare the patient for extra anatomic bypass? So, so you got the imaging. Uh, cardiology said the patient is a high risk for the extra anatomic bypass. You went and you talked to anesthesia. You got to get, get them involved early. Tell them I'm going to do this procedure under local. Uh, X-ray session can, X-ray artery can be explored under local. Same. Um, both the growings can be done under local. But you tell them like I'm gonna walk, I'll warn you when I do the tunnel part so they can give you they can give a little bit more pain medication to the patient. So what other important things you have to make sure before we go into the operating room? <laughs> Yeah. So whenever you do bypass, three things very important: inflow, outflow, and conduit. You have to make sure you have a graft available to do this. You're not going to use a vein for this. Right? So ring PTFE. Usually they have a bifurcated graft that comes from the axilla, and it's already like this limb is already sewn. You can put it on the uh, other femoral, or like left femoral. This goes to the right femoral. So you have to make sure your graft is available. Then you obviously look at the inflow and the outflow. How you will determine which axillary artery you will come from? So right axillary or left axillary? Hands for right, left. Anyone for left? Okay, why right? and right axillary is okay. But because of the spillover disease, atherosclerosis is more common in left subclavian rather than the right subclavian. So important to check blood pressure and then you do your X femoral bypass and you can do this under local. Especially if you have uh, two people involved, you can do it like fast if the patient has a lot of other comorbidities. So next question is a 74 year old uh, comes to the ER with drying angry. So these are almost like daily scenarios we see in uh, our hospital or in the clinic. So drying angry, first stone, no palpable pulse in the right foot. What's, what, how, how are we going to treat this patient? The patient is in the ER right now. Shall we go for two amp? Yeah, so do not go for 2M. So that, that this is the, basically they wanted to see like whether you're going to amputate this gangrene or whether you're going to revascularize the patient first. So 
if possible, always, always revascularize, then go for amputation. If the patient has obvious infection that needs to be taken care of, um, but if it's a dry gangrene, always revascularize first and then go for amputation. So 68-year-old diabetic peripheral neuropathy, non-healing plantar ulcer, now draining pus, some surrounding erythema, does not have palpable pulses. What are we going to do with this patient now? <coughs> Book for angiogram, bypass. Source control. source control, very important. So source control for wet gangrene, dry gangrene can wait. 52-year-old lifestyle limiting right leg claudication due to short segment stenosis of right common iliac artery. What is your approach for this patient's treatment? So, what if there was, was just claudication and not lifestyle limiting claudication? Alright, so now it's a lifestyle limiting claudication. So, right common iliac artery stenosis. What kind of stent for iliac balloon expandable? So endovascularly, uh, for especially for iliac artery, the patency is excellent, it's like 80, 90 percent five-year patency rate. Or especially for common age, because it's a large vessel, the flow is brisk, so not like SFA, it's like a small vessel. So that was one of the question on, on my like app side, like fourth year or something, like which stent has the most patency? So it was iliac, uh, SFA on proximal SFA, common femoral, but usually do you do not put a stent in common femoral because if it's a bend area. And try not to put any stents where they're like bend area, like for example, knee area. 62-year-old smoker with half block claudication, failed SFA angioplasty stenting comes to your office for evaluation. So let's take this question when you ask that 62-year-old comes with half block claudication, uh, you did medical management for six months. Then they're going to shift this patient to like they'll make you into either like a patient has lifestyle limiting claudication now and uh, or rest pain. Then you're obligated. Then you have to intervene on these patients. Um, so you did an angiogram. You did a angioplasty and stenting, but that's gone down now. What are the options? So NR, uh, who said NR? So which which end? How, how are you going to do that? No, you can take the stent out. And our take me of the whole SFA. No. What's the length of SFA? You're going to make an incision like this. Usually, it's right around the bottom. Yeah, but the SFA. Assume this is like a long segment SFA occlusion stent. So what are the options then? How is femfem going to work? Is it reconstituted? Yeah, so <coughs> common femoral is open, profunda is open, SFA is austerly occluded, and it reconstitutes above the knee popliteal artery. And you can see this stem. So this is the picture. common femoral, this is your profunda, and uh, it's included here. Then it reconstitutes here above the knee. So what are the options? Common femoral to above knee pop. So uh, this, is, this is also one of the operations you have to describe it on your oral board exam. Um, so basically, you dissect the common femoral artery, proximal distal control, dissect the profunda also. So always feel for so three things again: inflow, outflow. See how your outflow is. Look at the vein mapping. See how your vein is, and then you do a vein bypass. If the vein is not available, what's the next uh, thing you can use? PT 
GFP. So above the top versus weight is almost the same results, like 70% patency. Um, what so the patient has some kind of infection, you don't want to use PTFA. Then you go for cryo. But cryo vein usually do not last long, but they can heal your ulcer or heal your amputation, and it goes down and goes down later on. But your amputation will be healed most of the time. Would you have option for like a Yes, so there are good questions. So, for example, you put a stent here, the stent is occluded. We have, a, in this hospital, we have a laser available, which you can go through, laser the whole stent. The only thing is, you can able to get the wire through this. So that's the most important thing. Or you put the laser, try to re-catalyze the stent. Um, but if you usually, if, to me, if the first endovascular stent goes down, second is this, not going to work most of the time. It depends if the patient is not a good operative candidate. I would definitely try some more endo option. Uh, for the next endo option, you have to see why the stent went down. Was it progression of disease? Whether this was some technical issue with uh, not landing the stent correctly in the distal zone or proximal, or uh, you have to extend the stent like proximal or distal, but you do not have room to extend it in the proximal. Why? You do not want to jail the profunda. You, we have seen patients in which, like uh, some of the cardiologists, they have like jailed the profunda because they want to get the good angiographic result. But then it's extremely not not good for the patient. Like it's extremely difficult salvage. Profunda is the artery you have to respect in the groin. Profunda is open. You can heal amputation. The your thigh is open. We have one or one patient in the hospital right now with profunda. It's, it's a good picture to look at. There is no profunda. He does not have a profunda. The last one and a half years is the first patient I've seen with no profunda. All right, I think so. Time is up. Uh, we'll continue in this next week. Just a 